You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. We're joined today by Catherine Miles, author of the forthcoming book, Trailed, One Woman's Quest to Solve the Shenandoah Murders. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really glad to be here. Hey, Kate, does your mom like it better if we call you Catherine or you've always said Kate and yet the book says Catherine Miles and looks very official? My mom wants you to call me Katie, but don't you dare, oh. because this will be a very short interview. <laughs> I hadn't ever thought of you as a Katie, and I will immediately put that thought out of my mind. Kate, talk to us a little bit about your personal and professional background and your previous work. I know you've got a previous book out. I trained as a journalist and worked as a journalist starting my junior year in high school. Then I went on and did a PhD in English literature with a specialty in environmental studies and gender studies. Immediately after that, I took a college teaching job at Unity College in Maine, which ended up figuring in this book and taught there full time for about 15 years. And while I was there, I started doing less scholarly writing and more popular writing. I've always been intensely interested in the relationships that people form with the natural world and the way in which environment really informs our identity. And so that had been my scholarly work. It became my popular work. And after my third book, I found my way into a full-time writing job at Outside Magazine where I was covering long and scenic trails, including the Appalachian Trail. And for a while, I've been teasing you about the fact that you've actually covered the outdoors and the environment and a lot of issues, but then you've also covered crime and, as I jokingly said to you, when bad things happen to good people outdoors, which seems to be a real subspecialty. That was not a planned subspecialty, <laughs> but I have somehow become the grim reaper of journalism. I do seem to be the person that editors contact when boats sink or people get eaten by sharks or whatever the case is. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. And the only thing that I can theorize is that in total truth, I'm a complete and total scaredy cat and am utterly impressionable and affected by all of this. The only thing I can think of is that level of inherent scaredy catness that I have helps me be empathetic, maybe, okay. to people's stories in a way that I can, in a secondary way, feel their experiences to some degree. And so I wonder if maybe that makes it easier for us to have a conversation about them in a way that doesn't feel so much like an interview. Although you're an outdoors woman and you've done all sorts of hiking and backcountry bushwhacking and that sort of thing, I don't see you as a scaredy cat, although you do mention in the book the different times where your own anxieties have overtaken you in a few spots, which I suppose happens to everybody. Yeah, and right before this book, I had written a series of articles about a woman named Jerry Largay, who was a 64-year-old grandmother who had gone hiking on the Appalachian Trail and oh, yeah. went missing. And it sparked this enormous, I don't know what the gender neutral word for manhunt is, human hunt in Maine. And she remained missing for several years. And immediately, I think law enforcement officials, and frankly, I assumed it had been foul play. It wasn't. As we learned later, she had become just tragically lost off the trail, managed to keep herself alive for 20 days, which is utterly remarkable because she had three days of food with her. And she kept a journal. And as she realized that her life was ending, she wrote these beautiful oh. letters to all of her family members. I had covered that story for the Boston Globe really 
enjoyed the opportunity to do it and felt really honored that the family was willing to talk to me about it. But it alone took a really big emotional toll on me as a person. And so when the prospect of this book came along, I was frankly hesitant because I knew and I had seen the toll that these types of books have taken on journal Michelle McNamara, David Carr, and that give me those who are still alive have been very honest and vocal about just how emotionally impactful and trying it is to do this kind of work. And so I knew that as susceptible as I am, I'm an emotional sponge, that it was going to be really hard to create the kind of psychological boundaries that I would need to keep working on this in a way that it didn't have a lot of negative impacts on my mental health, frankly. I remember reading the articles that you did for the Boston Globe, which were terribly impactful on me as well. And I remember telling other people the story as you had conveyed it to me as a reader, just the tragedy of what happened to me and just how close they think that the searchers were to coming upon her during that initial search period. She was so close. She really wasn't very far away at all from the Appalachian Trail. And all it took was a wrong turn and extremely dense woods. And even though they ran a very first-class search for her, they were unsuccessful. Ultimately, when the story was told and she was found and she was deceased and nothing beyond a tragic accident had happened to her, it really impacted me. And even when I've told the story, which is basically reflecting your Boston Globe work, people just are devastated that just by mere happenstance... You can get turned around in the woods, walk a few hundred feet off the Appalachian Trail and be lost. Especially in the East. We think about the expanse of wilderness in the West, miles and miles of public land. And you think, yeah, somebody could go missing there. And in fact, there was a really powerful article in Outside Magazine a few years ago detailing just how many thousands of people have gone missing on public lands and in national parks just without a trace. That was very sobering for me because I certainly didn't know it was that pervasive of a problem. But I think that idea was very chilling for some people, as well as the idea, and Bill, I know you've experienced this in your own life too, is that we just assume that authorities are going to be able to solve the problem, right? We assume authorities are either going to find the missing person or they're going to find the perpetrator or whatever else, and that a case will get closed and closure will happen and that we won't be able to bring someone back, but we'll at least be able to know what happened. And I think what we see time and time again, especially in these wilderness cases, is twofold. First, just how hard it is to investigate a wilderness crime. And then secondly, I think, especially where, for instance, the FBI is concerned, the FBI is really trained to investigate urban crimes. If you look at the way in which our federal law enforcement academies are set up to investigate these crimes, all of the details and the procedures they're supposed to go through are things like secure the premises, lock the door, things that look for fingerprints, things that just don't work when you're in the wilderness. And you may not even know, for instance, where Jerry Largay went missing, where a crime occurred, what the debris field is. And so the number of questions that happen when we need to do an investigation in the backcountry, I think is really overwhelming, even for really trained investigators. Yeah, Jerry's story is very striking and ultimately quite tragic. Here's a challenge for you. Before we get into the Julie Williams Lolly Winans case uh, a bit more, can you name all of your previous books? Let's see here. There was Adventures with Ari, which was a book about a year I spent in the wilderness with my dog. There was All Standing, which was a book about the Irish famine and the only famine ship of 5,000 famine ships that managed to keep all of its passengers alive. That Interest in Tall Ships led me to my third book, Superstorm, which was an account of Superstorm Sandy, which was born out of an article I had written for Outside Magazine about the sinking of the bounty in that storm. And then that led me to Quakeland, the road to America's next devastating earthquake. And I don't know exactly what the connection is that gets us from Quakeland to Trailed, but then Trailed (laughs) is the fit. So how ultimately did you end up hearing about Julie Williams and Lolly Winans, and what kind of dinged in your head and made you go, ooh, I like this. This is interesting. 
Yeah. And I first learned of their case in 1998. They were murdered in May of 96. And that was right when I was graduating from college. And so while I was a contemporary of theirs of age, and while the story was absolutely national news, for whatever reason, between packing up college apartment and things like that, I had somehow missed it that summer. But then in 1998, when I was a graduate student, I was backpacking on the Appalachian Trail by utter coincidence, had stopped at a shelter where another very violent double murder had occurred on the Appalachian Trail. And backpacking had become a real defining activity in my life that I really can't Mm -hmm. underestimate. It was through backpacking that I had dealt with my own sexual assault. It was through backpacking that I had found really a way to feel good in my body again. And I felt so safe whenever I was in the wilderness. So I was at this shelter and I was talking to some of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy workers there who were telling me about what had happened at the shelter. And it was utterly shattering to me to think that violence could occur in the place where I felt the safest. So when I got back from that particular trip, I started doing research and I found an amazing book by Claudia Brenner called Eight Bullets, which is an account of the attack that she and her partner encountered while they were hiking in Pennsylvania and very tragically killed her partner, Claudia Brenner, who had been shot multiple times, somehow heroically managed to hike several miles out of the wilderness and get help. And that story, particularly since it was told in first person, had just been, I think, one of the most influential books I had ever read. And it was during that search and that sort of deep dive that I was doing that I first learned about Lolly and Julie's case. So again, 1998. And then flash forward, fall of 2001, by utter coincidence, I end up teaching at the little environmental studies college where Lolly had been a student when she was murdered. And then that spring, 2002, John Ashcroft, the attorney general, made this very public announcement that there'd been an indictment in the case. And the effect that had on our tiny little college and the community was really significant. And I saw firsthand how it affected Lolly's professors, Lolly's friends, her co-workers, because the legacy she had left at that college, you just cannot really be described. So then it was very present for me, but it hadn't really occurred to me to write a book on it until the 20th anniversary of the crimes when I realized that the indictment had ultimately stalled, that there was not a person who had ever been convicted for this, that this was an open case. And that was so confusing and troubling to me. So I contacted the FBI. I was going to do a story on it for Outside Magazine. We arranged for me to spend a day at the FBI forensic lab at Quantico. And we arranged for me to spend a day with FBI investigators and National Park Service investigators at the murder scene. And I think at the time, the FBI thought that this was going to be a very pro FBI Hmm. piece where I was like, look at all the awesome work that the FBI is doing. But I left with a lot more questions than that. And I realized that a feature story was going to be way too short to tell this story. And that's how it eventually became a book. The outside story did run though. No, we actually decided based on what I was finding in rapid order, what I was finding is that we decided that it would be best to wait until the book came out. And so now it's going to run as an excerpt in the magazine. And you've been working on the book for four years? And some change. Wow. I was struck by something earlier when I reached out to you to confirm our appointment. You and I met over three years ago when you were already well into working on the book, which is amazing. Yeah, and you're you are a character in this book, (laughs) as is your dog. Because yeah, I found you on a discussion board about the Colonial Parkway murders, which as some people have made attempts to correlate them or even assign the same perpetrator to both crimes. And so I reached out to you, you wrote right back. And then as I write in the book, it was an act of faith to get in my car and drive five hours to this very remote farmhouse to meet someone who I assumed was on the up and up, but (laughs) wasn't sure until I got there. (laughs) Although I think something about my partner, Pamela, making soup And uh, our friendly dachshund convinced you that all was going to be fine at this uh, remote. Such is so full of good, warm, artistic (laughs) energy that the minute I walked in, I knew I was completely (laughs) fine. Your partner, Ray, in the book, he made these arrangements, I guess you'd call them, that you were going to text 
from the time you got there and then reach out again once you were inside the house and that these people weren't crazy oddballs. And they, <laughs> he said if he didn't hear from you, he was going to call the police. And, of course, I was laughing because we're in the boonies of Connecticut up here. <laughs> and yeah. the, we're only covered by the state police. There are no town police in these small towns. What you forget is that he is a senior military officer. And so I have no doubt he had a Black Hawk helicopter on standby and probably <laughs> some sort of surveillance equipment on your house already. So who knows what the real story was there. It's probably classified. It's true. And so Black Ops people would have probably parachuted down into the snow and rescued you. That would have made the news. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Even have, in Connecticut. It would have gotten our attention. <laughs> I was going to say, since we're already on the subject, and you brought up the question earlier that there are some people who think that Julie and Lolly's murder might be connected to the Colonial Parkway murders. I'm sure you did discuss that with Belle. What do you think? Do you want to jump right into that right now? Sure. Yeah. It's cert there's certain facts of the two cases that are undeniably similar, right? They're both, they both occur on National Park administered land, right? They both involve a young, athletic, super competent lesbian couple. The actual details of the murders are quite similar in terms of how the two women were subdued and ultimately killed. And then the other piece that has really interested some people is that, so first of all, they were 10 years apart. And four of the park rangers who were in the case of Kathy and Becky were also present in Shenandoah Park and worked as law enforcement officers on Lolly and Julie's case. And then one of them was at the Grand Canyon 10 years later in 1996, when a young Japanese woman was murdered just outside the park. And so some people have thought that's too much of a coincidence to be ignored. It's worth noting, too, that both sets of murders happened on three-day holiday weekends mm -hmm. in these national parks. Now, on the other side, they are, what is it, Kristen, about 180 miles apart, if I'm not mistaken? I'm not great with numbers, but yeah, that's about right. And 10 years apart as well. Yeah. So we're talking about 1986 for Kathy Thomas and Rebecca Dowski and 1996 for Julie Williams and Lolly Winans. But even the FBI said at the time in the press that they were exploring the idea that these Two double homicides were substantially similar. That's the expression they used. And some of the founders of the behavioral science unit even went on record saying that they thought that the similarities were enough to suggest that the same perpetrator, or at least certainly the same kind of perpetrator, had been involved in both. You mentioned the National Park Service Rangers. Did you ever think there might be something to Certainly, I tried to explore every possible lead that I could. And as I was writing the book, I had all sorts of theories at one time or another. I tried to be as open to the theories as possible. I thought it was noteworthy that the FBI certainly thought that was worth pursuing. At one time, one of the head ranger at Shenandoah National Park was their prime suspect to the point that they had search warrants. They were vacuuming his truck, things like that as well, too. Certainly, there is precedent for that idea. I eventually personally moved in another direction and I cite another individual who I think most likely committed the murders, but certainly it's a, I think it's something to look at. And one of the things I talk about in the book is not only how underfunded and hamstrung national parks are in terms of law enforcement, but also just how frankly egregious the problems that are there both in terms of the increase in violent crimes that are happening there and also the park's inability to really deal with them. Right now, there still is no codified system for reporting on violent crimes in the national parks. And so what we know based on Government Accountability Office and also Department of the Interior Inspector General Office reports is that crimes are underreported in the parks. They're under investigated, the clearance rates there are the lowest among all of law enforcement officers. And so there's national reckoning that needs to happen, both in terms of funding national parks, in terms of infrastructure, and also in terms of making sure that we're doing everything we can to ensure they're safe for the visitors. The National Park Service has a terrible reputation for law enforcement and for 
taking care of visitors when there are problems in national parks. I don't think there's much way around that. And they also have a bizarre culture that has developed, which actually reminds me of my time as an altar boy in the Catholic Church in the Boston Diocese. They're known and are often criticized for covering up problems in the National Park Service. Did you run into any of this in your research? I did. I did. And I should say also, I ran into a lot of really talented, dedicated law enforcement rangers who are doing an outstanding job, and we should all be glad that they're there. And so I don't want to throw the entire National Park Service or even the law enforcement rangers under the bus. But you're absolutely right that there is this problem um, it's like the blue line that people talk about sometimes with law enforcement. And there have been some very powerful whistleblowers who have both testified before Congress and also written their own books, looking at the way in which some rangers are inclined to cover up for others and that some rangers feel inclined to cover up for themselves. Again, that's something that I think is an ongoing consideration for the Department of the Interior and one that hasn't really been considered. Just a few years ago, there was a huge expose on sexual harassment and sexual abuse happening, especially at places like the Grand Canyon. And that was mostly employee on employee harassment and abuse, where mostly female or people who identify as female rangers really didn't feel safe. And at some points were even sexually assaulted by fellow rangers or other employees in the park. And that this had gone on for a very long time and had never been reported. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. My sense of it is that the National Park Service has sold us all a bill of goods. In other words, they have created this vision of the national parks as these bucolic, wonderful places, which they are, but at the same time, and I remember that when this story broke about the sexual assaults and sexual harassment in the National Park Service, it's just horrific, the horrible things that have happened and been covered up by the National Park Service. I don't want to throw the entire agency under the bus either, but from personal experience, and Kristen can attest to this as well, the National Park Service has thrown up roadblock after roadblock in the Colonial Parkway murders investigation, you end up walking away thinking maybe all is not right with this agency. Yeah, and to put this in a larger context, I think we have to remember that the National Park Service is part of the Department of the Interior. Right now, the National Park Service has a multi-billion dollar backlog of what they call deferred maintenance because they've been so underfunded by the Department of the Interior. And so I think we really have to hold accountable previous presidential administrations and departments of the interior. In 1996, when Lolly and Julie were murdered, Shenandoah had a huge shortage of rangers. There were not enough law enforcement rangers. They had There had been a budget freeze, and so they weren't even really able to keep up with just natural disasters. There was a big blizzard that year, and they couldn't even deal with that. They famously didn't have working radios for the rangers, and so... Not only were guests less safe than they should have been at the parks, but the rangers were frankly less safe. And that continues, right? Exponentially more rangers are killed than FBI agents are killed in the line of duty. And again, I think as a country, we're not doing enough to protect them as well. So I know that to do the research for this book, you did end up going to Shenandoah quite a number of times. Talk a little bit about your experience of going to Shenandoah, looking at the crime scene and what it took to, to get a feel for the very large scope of this case. Yeah. And as I was saying earlier, I'm a scaredy cat and I was really nervous going deliberately going to the scene of an incredibly violent murder. That was not something I was enthusiastic about. As I write in the book, the whole night before I was tossing and turning in bed. And I think this is something that that folks don't talk about enough. When we watch true crime, when we read true crime, we get a very antiseptic account of it. And rightfully, like it is respectful 
and necessary, both to the victims and survivors, not to be graphic with this. And when we watch TV show, when we read books, it's the violence is suggested. It's more so than it's explicit. But that doesn't happen when you're actually researching. And as I'm sure you two have experienced firsthand, looking into an actual crime is an incredibly grisly, horrific experience. And I knew that. And going to the scene initially, I was very apprehensive about that. But as I write in the book, what really struck me as I first approached this campsite, and I should say, by way of explanation, Lolly and Julie were these incredibly skilled backcountry leaders, real just leaders in the field already. And so they knew how to be backcountry campers. They practice what's called leave no trace. And in places like Shenandoah, when you're backcountry camping, this isn't like a campsite like you'd pull up to at a KOA or a state park, right? It's not like there's not a tent site in the fire pit and a picnic table. They were they bushwhacked into mm-hmm. just a hidden cleared area where they thought it would be a good place to set up a tent and where they could be unseen, which again, I think is a really important detail that we can talk about later is just how hidden this campsite was. So how was it that anyone could ever find it? But going there with the rangers who had worked the case and with the FBI agents, what I was immediately struck by more than anything was just how beautiful and secluded a spot it was. It's a beautiful place. There's a stream running through, there's rhododendrons blooming. And it was a little reassuring for me to be in that place, this place of incredible beauty, this place that was such an amazing backcountry site that I say as a backpacker, if I had found that site, I would have thought I was the luckiest person in the world. And to be there and to think for a moment, at least less about the violence that had occurred there and more about just just the real beauty of these two lives that spent time there. And as I say in the book, part of me wondered, like, maybe what the trace that was left there was less the violence and more just like the incredible life and vibrance and love that these two people had. When you first went there, did you go there by yourself or with the investigators and rangers? We were an entourage. (laughs) There was the lead investigator, the lead agent for the FBI who has since retired. There was a member of the FBI evidence response team, an FBI public affairs liaison, a National Park Service public affairs liaison, at least three different rangers. We were a parade. And as I say in the book, too, it was almost comical because, as you both know, the FBI is famously a black box of information. And the public affairs person kept saying, we can't talk about any ongoing cases as we're standing at the murder scene of an (laughs) ongoing case. And so it it became this absurd like game of telephone that I detail in the book where it's like, how do I ask questions about the place where we are if we're not supposed to be at the place where we are? Mm -hmm. And that's just an ongoing culture of the FBI that I think causes all kinds of frustration and consternation for all sorts of people. How does someone like yourself get that level of access? This was very striking to me when I was reading the book, how much they gave you in terms of resources and information. This is something that constantly amazes me in my profession, that when I was working on Superstorm, the book, I contacted the Coast Guard and I was like, hey, you guys do all these crazy helicopter rescues. Can I go to your advanced helicopter rescue school for a couple of days and fly around in a helicopter? And they were like, yeah, sure. Or I've contacted mine operators. Can I go 7,000 feet down in your mine? And people say yes. So that is amazing. I think most agencies, most scientists, people honestly want to share the work that they do. And I think, again, I think the FBI saw this as an opportunity to really share and promote the work that they do. So we did take a few months of negotiating back and forth, but eventually we settled on this, which really was a remarkable opportunity for me. I don't want to give away too much of the book because, of course, we want people to read and buy the book. But at some point or another, I do want to make sure that we get into Daryl David Rice. Let's go ahead and jump to Daryl David Rice. Can you very quickly for our listeners explain who he is and then tell us why he is probably not the person who killed Julie and Lolly? Because his name comes up even for us a lot. Sure. So as far as we can estimate. Lolly and Julie were murdered in late May 
of 96. And there's a little bit of debate about the date that they were killed, but we think it was probably around May 27th, 1996. So afterwards, there's this fog of war as rangers and the FBI, first of all, are sorting out their own turf war, right? They have joint purview in this case because it's the National Park Service, very different cultures, very different approaches to investigating. And as I talk about in the book, that culture clash, I think, really led to some significant mishandling of evidence that caused a lot of evidence just to go missing, basically. They're just hustling, trying to find this person. They have dozens and dozens of suspects. They've uncovered an ungodly number of sex offenders, felons, escaped convicts in the park that weekend, which is shocking to me. They began to suspect each other with the rangers. This goes on for a good six, eight, nine months. They think they have a suspect. That suspect falls through. Now it's spring of 97, and they've basically exhausted all of their leads. And the case is at risk of going cold. And then in July of 97, so about 14 months after the original crime, a man named Daryl David Rice, whose father lived just outside the park, had driven to the park. He, he has some significant mental health issues, bipolar schizophrenia, and things had begun to unravel at work. He was unraveling in terms of his own mental health. He'd been up for several days by his own admission, smoking a lot of marijuana. He drives into the park and sees a female cyclist on Skyline Drive, the main road through the park, and he accosts her. He shouts obscenities at her. He throws a Pepsi bottle at her. He runs her off the road. And again, I'm not excusing any of this behavior by a long shot. But when this happens and it gets reported to the rangers, they immediately think, we've got our guy. This must be the person who killed Lolly and Julie. They apprehend him. And when they do, he asks them, did you ever solve that murder of these of those two young women who were in the park last year? And now the rangers are thinking, all right, this is all just way too much of a coincidence. And so they arraign him for the crime against the cyclist. But at that point, that's really just a stopgap because they're convinced that Rice has done this. And the FBI spent untold resources unbelievable resources trying to get Rice to confess. They embedded their lead counter-terrorist investigator in his cell. They fabricated issues of the Washington Post. They had extended letter writing campaigns and fabricated postal stamp cancellations from Europe. All of these things completely focused at Daryl Rice. And at that point, to the exclusion of all other suspects. That blew my mind when I read that. Like, literally, I was sitting there reading my jaw, just agape, could not believe that. And Daryl David Rice is definitely a name that comes up with relation to our case a lot. We do have people who reach out and ask, well, have you guys considered Daryl David Rice? So at what point did you, as a researcher, become convinced that, okay, this guy, he's not the guy? It took a while. And in fact, I was looking at my book proposal a couple of days ago. And in the book proposal, which is you do that before you write the book in nonfiction, Mm -hmm. to make it sound like Daryl Rice did it. I was convinced he had done it because I think like a lot of people, I assumed the FBI had done their due diligence. The Department of Justice would never make this public indictment unless they were absolutely sure. Justice must be served because that's what happens in these cases. And so I think I went in assuming, and the FBI investigators, when I had interviewed them on the 20th anniversary, they were making it very clear to me that they still thought that Daryl Rice was guilty. They still are completely convinced that Daryl Rice is guilty. So I think I went in there, and I went in there with a lot of trepidation because I knew that this was a guy with mental health issues, with a history of violence, who was out in the world. And I was like, is he going to come get me? And some of the rangers I talked to insinuated that was a possibility. So there was definitely some fear for me going into it. What I realized really quickly talking to forensic psychologists, FBI profilers, and some of the rangers that were involved in the case was everything about this case was so meticulous and planned. It was what forensic psychologists call an organized crime. 
right? This was not the first murder that this person had done. This person showed up with a murder kit. He was able to subdue two very strong women and their dog, leave next to no evidence. This was not a first rodeo for this person. Everything about Daryl Rice was a total train wreck. When Mm. they were examining his truck, it hadn't been cleaned out in years. And he couldn't make breakfast half the time, let alone do this. And so that was always a really big sticking point for me, just in terms of the profile of him. And then as I dug deeper and got access to some of the FBI forensic lab report, the DNA reports, everything else like that, there was never anything other than one very strange circumstantial coincidence that would put Rice anywhere near involved in this case whatsoever, no matter the fact that the FBI literally tried every single thing they could to try to get him to confess or do anything to implicate himself, and he never has. Let's talk about that access for a minute. One of our biggest frustrations in the Colonial Parkway murders is that we're constantly being asked questions about the Parkway murders, and we don't have access to... FBI or National Park Service or Virginia State Police investigative files. How is it that you have access to all of this information to write trail? And this is one of the very unique aspects of this case. So Dale Rice was indicted in 2002. Then Attorney General John Ashcroft announced that this would be a federal case tried under brand new hate crime enhanced sentencing legislation. So Lolly and Julie's murder, which happened three years before Matthew Shepard, a case people might be familiar with, their case was actually the first federal hate crime. So Rice was indicted. Prosecutors went forward with the case up to the point of jury selection. And at the very last minute during jury selection, some new DNA information came back. It was the Hail Mary pass that the government had to implicate Rice. It actually excluded Rice as the previous DNA tests had. And so faced with that, the prosecution knew that at best they had an uphill battle. They dismissed the charges against Daryl Rice in a form that's what's called without prejudice. And this is really important, I think, because Rice is either the only American or one of two Americans who currently is in the situation of what is ultimately double jeopardy. When a case is dismissed without prejudice, it can be brought back almost exactly to where it stopped anytime. So the FBI is literally just waiting for like that one more piece of evidence so they can go right back to the trial. And I think that's really important. But because it had made it that far before it was dismissed in that way, federal cases have very strict discovery requirements. And discovery is basically where the two sides have to exchange all the information they have. And so because of that, when I even just went to the federal court depository to find the records, I found amazing resources that in general you would never have, including things like the medical examiner's reports, things like that. So that was very instrumental. And that was really when the focus of my investigation began to turn because I saw, first of all, just how thin, which is to say almost invisible, the federal case was against Rice. And so that just didn't work. And so then at that point, I contacted Deirdre Enright, who is the head of the Virginia Innocence Project and who was also on Rice's legal team. Because she had been on his legal team, she had access to all of the evidence in the case, which she very smartly photocopied. And I should say, it's a really interesting sub story here. She was going to all of these pretrial hearings and people kept making mention to files that the defense didn't have. The defense was given Mm -hmm. this very thin file and then they'd reference something else. And Deirdre caught on to that. And she was like, wait a minute, I don't have that file. Or wait a minute, that's a 12 page file. And I only have three pages of it. And she did her own gumshoe detecting and eventually figured out that the FBI had an entire storage unit, the kind of place where you store a small airplane, for instance, full of evidence that the press, that the defense had never seen. And so she demanded access to it. She drove up in her little minivan with a little photocopier and a ladder so that she could plug it into the ceiling outlet. And she photocopied hundreds and hundreds of pages of relevant evidence, 22 boxes in whole, which she then made available to me. And that really was what allowed me to do this work. 
This is extremely unusual in that this case moved forward to the point where the DOJ dropped it, basically, or put it on hold all those years ago. And yet, because there had been all these legal proceedings, these files were available to the defense who made them available to you. Because as you both know, freedom of information access requests, which are the bread and butter of how this work usually gets done, are almost always denied by the FBI. And frankly, denied for erroneous causes. As American citizens, whether you're a journalist or not, whether you have any like firsthand interest in a case or not, as an American citizen, we have the right to file what's called a FOIA request to get information. And the FBI is notorious for not abiding by any of those requests far more often than they should. And in fact, there's an entire sort of journalist watchdog organization that you can ask to help you in these FOIA requests because they deny so many more than they should. Oh, they've done this in the Colonial Parkway murders over and over again. Where we've had success is other agencies responding to FOIA requests. The FBI is always extremely unhappy when we hit pay dirt because these other agencies might not have the absolutely strict attitude that the FBI takes, which is we're going to give you nothing. Absolutely nothing. We don't care that you're the brother of the murder victim, et cetera, et cetera. The other agencies will oftentimes respond to our FOIA requests with information which the FBI would dearly love us not to have. So you were able to work around that because this case against Rice had actually proceeded into court and therefore these documents were available. And I also had the advantage of several of the law enforcement rangers who worked on the case who were willing to help. And so they would hand me documents. And and so some of what I have too is because they now retired, were willing to share those documents as well too. And that was really interesting to me. Again, this culture, cultural difference between the National Park Service investigators and their willingness to help in the case and the FBI's utter, not just reluctance, but resistance to helping. Which is really interesting because if you think about the number of, this is my word and I don't mean it pejoratively, but the armchair detectives, the people who are on the discussion boards, amateur sleuths are solving cases. So we just saw the Zodiac cipher solved last year by three complete and total amateurs. And this idea of crowdsourcing crime investigation and people who feel not beholden to FBI process, but are able to go out and investigate on their own, they're actually solving crimes. So I think it raises a question too, of what's lost when the American public doesn't have access to information that could help them do that. That's going to do it for this episode of Mind Over Murder with author Kate Miles. We will continue this conversation next time. Until then, thank you so much for listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.